In a video posted on November the 9th, 2021, Dr. John Campbell uses simple means to explain to his audience how an enzyme called 3CL protease is used by COVID-19 to cut long proteins into smaller constituents and that this is a vital part of the virus's means of replication. And so, finding a way to inhibit this enzyme would impair viral replication and potentially save the lives of people with severe COVID-19 disease. This gives him a veneer of authority on the subject, but then he proceeds to criticise the drug Nemetrovir, or PF0732132, which is synthesised by Pfizer Incorporated. John Campbell claims that ivermectin already inhibits the 3CO enzyme. But according to his friend and unfunny comedian Jimmy Dore, this little-known fact about ivermectin is ignored due to it being out of patent, making it more profitable for Pfizer to synthesize a drug that inhibits the same enzyme, but can be sold for higher profits. And why would they do that? Well, ivermectin is, is generic, so anybody can produce it, so there's no profit to be made from it anymore. And now, he's got some, they have a new drug, Right, they have a new drug uh, from Pfizer that's supposed to be able to treat COVID, and he is going to put it up against ivermectin. Watch this. Now, um, if we look at this compared to the other, the other drugs, this is particularly useful. So here's all the other drugs that were testing along the bottom here. So they were testing all of these medicines along the bottom here. That's what they were testing, and this is the percentage of three uh, CL enzymic activity present. So the shorter this, the shorter these bits the more the enzyme was inhibited. This was from the original Pfizer paper. It is working this way because the original Pfizer paper says that the new Pfizer medication is designed to block the activity of the SARS coronavirus 2. Three chymotryptin-like protease. In other words, it acts the same way as the sellotape round the pair of scissors, as indeed we have given um, evidence for um, ivermectin doing. And it might be true that ivermectin binds to the active site of the 3CL protease, preventing it from modifying proteins into the shapes and sizes it needs to make copies of itself. However, his analysis conveniently omits several known properties of ivermectin. Simply inhibiting the 3CL enzyme in computer modelling and in the 96 world plate is not the full story. A lot of things will work in a petri dish that won't work in an animal model, let alone a human clinical trial. First thing we need to know is that how good a drug is at inhibiting a biochemical function when administered to a patient is measured as IC50. IC50 is short for half maximal inhibitory concentration. So we might ask how high a concentration of a drug is needed to reduce the amount of a biochemical reaction occurring by 50%. And when we compare the IC50 concentration of the new Pfizer drug Nemetrovir to Ivermectin, we expose the first flaw in his argument. Nemetrovir has an IC50 against 3CL protease activity of 0.023 micromolar. The study that John Campbell references himself clearly estimates ivermectin's IC50 as 21.5 micromolar, making it a whopping 934.78 times higher. I'm sure he left that part out accidentally, but anyway, some other research puts the IC50 of ivermectin against general COVID activity in the lungs at around 2 micromolar. So if you could get a 2 micromolar concentration of ivermectin in the tissue of the lungs, it might half COVID activity. However, the authors found a problem. Ivermectin simply won't accumulate freely in the blood, nor in the lungs at 2 micromolar, even if you repeat a dose that's 10 times the therapeutic window. In their own words, even with the high lung homogenate plasma ratio, ivermectin is unlikely to reach the IC50 of 2 micromolar in the lungs after a single oral administration of the approved dose. Predicted lung concentration, 0.0873 micromolar. A bit short of 2 micromolar, isn't it? In fact, it's just 4.37% of what's needed. The authors also said that even when using the ballpark accumulation ratio for higher doses, predicted lung concentrations would be one-fifth the IC50 after ingesting 60mg tablets three times a week, or after 120mg once a week. I mean, you could just keep taking more and more ivermectin until you reach the IC50, but you would put yourself in a coma. Need proof? 
let's take the 1 -fifth figure and times it by 5. 120 milligrams times 5 equals 600 milligrams. We know from case reports of people trying to self-medicate using ivermectin ampules designed for horses that 227.5 milligrams can leave you in a stupor where you're unresponsive to stimuli, and that is just 37% of the amount of ivermectin you'd need. So at this point you're probably asking why it's impossible to achieve the desired IC50 despite ingesting so much ivermectin, and the answer is that the majority of it will not move freely by itself in the blood. Instead, around 93% of it will bind to albumin, a protein found in the blood and produced by the liver. And as a result of this, when ivermectin reaches the alveoli, where gas is exchanged between the lungs and the blood, most of it isn't able to cross the capillary cell walls, nor the basal lamnia, and thus cannot be uptaken by pneumocytes, nor the other cell types that are usually attacked by COVID-19. It's the same reason why ivermectin binding to COVID-19 spike proteins is irrelevant, because there's a lot of albumin in your blood. So in short, ivermectin doesn't work, but we are not done yet. Campbell also tries to back up his misinformation by referencing a meta-analysis that was widely criticised for its god-awful methodology. Oh, and this time he conveniently leaves out the EC50, which is similar to the IC50, but cell culture side. And I'm sure, once again, that is totally by accident. Anyway, if you have never heard of a meta-analysis before, it is essentially a standard mean difference, that's an average taken from as many comparable clinical trials or experiments as possible. Why do we do this? Well, sometimes it isn't clear whether a drug is beneficial or not. Take a person like Joe Rogan telling you how he threw everything and the kitchen sink at COVID-19 disease. I got up in the morning, got tested, and turns out I got COVID. So we immediately threw the kitchen sink at it. All kinds of meds, monoclonal antibodies, uh, ivermectin, z uh prednisone, everything. Uh, and I also got an NAD drip and a vitamin drip and I did that three days in a row. And so here we are on Wednesday and I feel great. To many people, this might sound like it validates ivermectin, but in reality he was taking multiple drugs at the same time and the improvement in his health could be down to any one of these. So a meta-analysis aims to find an average in effectiveness across multiple clinical trials. For example, if you can find enough clinical trials with published results, where patients with the same disease are broken into one group receiving standard treatment, and another group receiving a new experimental drug, then you can usually make a meta-analysis from this data by pooling it all together. The meta-analysis that Campbell cites is not very good for several reasons. One, the main forest plot includes trials that the authors know are at high risk of bias. Two, they remove these trials in sensitivity analysis in addition to removing trials with active comparators. When both are removed together, no studies on severe COVID-19 disease remain. 3. Two-thirds of the weight of the data for the remaining studies are provided by a single study, and all have a total of just 24 events. 4. The raw data isn't available for peer review. Shocking, I know. And 5. It was crowdfunded for some reason? Asking for money to get a life-saving medication approved. Totally impartial and non-partisan, I'm sure. Misinformation has real-world consequences for people. Just turn on the news and look at the protests. And if I've convinced you to stop listening to the misinformation of John Campbell, you might be asking, how did he dupe me in the first place? How is he successfully duping so many people? In 1980, the psychologist Dr. Craig Anderson ran an experiment where two groups of people were placed in separate lecture rooms. Both groups were told they were part of an experiment and the groups were each given a lecture that was different from the other. Group 1 was told that people who are high-risk takers make better firefighters. Group 2 was told that people who are risk-adverse were better firefighters. 
The two groups were then told to find explanations and a theory for why this is the case, and after the participants had created and presented their theories to each other, they were told that the information they were given at the beginning was untrue, and that the entire event was just an experiment that had now ended. But in fact, the experiment was not over. The researchers kept observing. What happened next was the participants continued to defend their theories and explanations for the false information that they had received, despite being told that it was false. This experiment shows that we tend to hold on to beliefs and conclusions that are demonstrably false so long as we can rationalise them ourselves. We tend to cling on to ideas due to what psychology refers to as belief perseverance. Which may explain why some people, no matter how much they are told the vaccine is safe, will instead double down and become even more reluctant to take it. Instead, they believe the misinformation peddled by a retired nurse who has a PhD in nursing, who uses the title of doctor to appear like an authority on topics like immunology and biochemistry when he isn't educated in either of them. If ivermectin actually worked, it would not be suppressed. Because if it did work, the only companies that would be able to meet the sudden increase in demand are those who already possess the specialist equipment and expertise in chemical engineering necessary to do so. And given that ivermectin is cheap, the lack of patent wouldn't stop large profits from being made. But instead of this scenario, you have companies like the original patent holder telling you that it does not work. And this is the critical flaw of people like Jimmy Dore who feel validated by what John Campbell has to say. Thank you for watching. In closing, I'd like to thank my friend, the history YouTuber Kraut, for giving me an illustration he made which was used in this video. I'd also like to shout out Dr. Yan Yu, who has taken the time to debunk claims by John Campbell that not aspirating the vaccine during administration causes inflammation of the heart, when in reality it isn't necessary to do so when administering to the deltoid muscle. Links to both of their channels are in the description.